introduce your teacher. I'm very excited to welcome to introduce you all to Rabbi Barry L. Schwartz, who's the director and editor in chief emeritus of the Jewish Publication Society, which is the oldest nonprofit, non denominational publisher of Jewish works in English. He's also the spiritual leader of Congregation Adas Emuno in Leonia, New Jersey. Um, and he's been the head of JPS for um, over 13 years now, 14 years, 15 years. Um, he's also the author of books for adults, teens, and children, including Path of the Prophets, The Ethics Driven Life from 2018, and Judaism's Great Debates, Timeless Controversies from Abraham to Herzl. And he'll be um, talking about uh, the late, great Norman Finkelstein's uh, book, and I'll let him probably introduce that because he can do a better job of that. So, Rabbi Schwartz, take it away. Thank you very much, Gabe. I'm uh, truly honored to uh, be here this uh, this afternoon and want to thank all of you for taking time out uh, during your day uh, for a challenging but important uh, uh, topic. I'd like to thank uh, Thea, who is forging a partnership between JPS and um, My Jewish Learning and 70 Faces uh, Media. I want to say that if you would like to correspond with me after the session, you can reach me via email at bschwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, at jps.org. I am now the Director and Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of uh, JPS, having left um, JPS just uh, uh, recently to uh, semi-retire. I continue on as a pulpit rabbi and uh, as an author, and if you would permit me just uh, a word about the Jewish Publication Society, I do believe it has been both a jewel in the crown and one of the best kept secrets of the Jewish community for the last 135 years. Because JPS began in Philadelphia in 1888. Actually, its roots are before the Civil War in Philadelphia, and it remains there all these decades later, we have published many great classics of Jewish learning. We're best known for the JPS Tanakh, our translation of the Hebrew Bible. And by the way, we have a newly revised translation that was just published this year. It's been my privilege to work with some of the greatest Jewish scholars in the world, especially Bible scholars, scholars of uh, Jewish thought and Jewish history. Uh, right now, this very season, we are publishing the magnum opus of Rabbi Yitz Greenberg called The Triumph of Life. And just for another example, we just published a major work by Daniil Hartman, the head of the Hartman um, Institute. So you can imagine the privilege it's been to work with great scholars and thinkers uh, over um, the years. I also uh, now want to pay tribute uh, to the late great Norman H. Finkelstein. Uh, Norman was uh, a master Jewish educator. In fact, um, he taught for 35 years at Hebrew College in Boston. But Norman was also a tremendous and prodigious author of biographies and historical books for young readers, for <clears throat> teens and also for uh, adults. As a matter of fact, we'll be speaking and utilizing his third book for JPS today. But I wanted to let you know that Norman, who passed away suddenly and unexpectedly, just as his book was coming to, uh, to print, wrote two books for young people, one called Heeding the Call, about the civil rights movement and the Jews, the second called Forged in Freedom, about American Jewish history, that both won National Jewish Book Awards in this day. So he was a two-time winner of the National Jewish uh, Book Awards. And uh, I would see Norman every year in New York City at something called BEA, the Book Expo of America, the largest publishing conference in the country that occurred at the Jacob Javits Center in New York every year. That's where Norman and I would meet and talk about ideas. And I commissioned the book that we're going to be studying in this course, Saying No to Hate, 
overcoming anti-Semitism in America. I'd like to show you uh, the cover of that book. I hope you can see it. And uh, I feel uh, such an imperative to be speaking in Norm's stead, not only because of my affection for Norm and because of the value of this book, but because I truly believe that the subject, um, once again, but somewhat unexpectedly but vehemently, has become the call of this hour. The call of this hour, in, in my opinion, is to teach about the history and combat anti-Semitism that has spiked once again since October 7th, and at the same time, teach and speak about the history of Zionism and Israel, since that is under assault as well. In fact, I'm going to be putting my uh, money where my mouth is, so to speak, uh, preaching what I, uh, doing what I'm preaching by teaching about this material in my own Torah study, in my own synagogue in Leona in New Jersey, starting this Shabbat uh, uh, as well. So in tribute to uh, Norman, but also recognizing the importance, the need of this hour, that's when I came to Thea and said, this is what I propose as the first project in the JPS, uh, My Jewish Learning, a partnership that is, is burgeoning um, right now. So we're going to be uh, going through a lightning tour of 375 years of American Jewish history. But if you would permit me today an extended introduction to the why of this course, uh, I, I think it will be uh, important. And let me just say that, you know, I believe that to truly advocate and combat anti-Semitism, we need to educate. We need to know the history of Jews overcoming anti-Semitism in this country, as we will see today from the very beginning, from the arrival of the very first Jews to these shores to October 7th and its aftermath. In the session today, we will be looking at the colonial revolutionary war period and then uh, early America. In the second session, we'll be looking at the Civil War era uh, through the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. And then in the final session, we'll be looking from the Civil Rights era to today, to October 7th and its aftermath. Those are the three historical periods we'll be considering in, in the three sessions of this course, each at an hour's uh, length. And the key thing that I want to look at in each case is how a flashpoint became a turning point in American Jewish history. What is it that transformed a moment from a simple historical occurrence to a milestone in the progress of Jews in this country? And I will tell you, that in each instance, a flashpoint turned into a, a turning point when Jews raised their voices, when they were not passive, and when they marshaled resources to combat the anti-Semitism that uh, occurred. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, share with you why this issue is so burning with me and perhaps with you, and that's part of the reason that we have uh, nearly 250 people already um, uh, in this course today. And so uh, I'm going to read two excerpts from two blogs that I recently read as part of this general introduction, and then we will jump into um, uh, the, the history uh, itself. Uh, I'm going to share the screen so that you can um, follow uh, along. These blogs are also found on in the Times of Israel uh, in my blog space uh, as well. This 
this uh, first blog is called Perplexity, 20 Questions for Which I Have No Answer. Uh, Gabe, are you able to see it? We are, yes. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to simply state these questions that have been on my mind in the course of our uh, study and, and discussion. We may gain some greater um, answers, particularly in the final session. <laughs> This is what has me perplexed, even more than perplexed. One, how is it that in much of the world there is understanding for the mass atrocities of October 7th? Two, how is it that in these same communities there is greater outrage against Israel's response to the Hamas massacre than to the massacre itself? Three, how is it that the greatest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust has caused the greatest outburst of anti-Semitism since the Holocaust? I mean, that's part of the reason we're here with such urgency today. Four, how is it that blaming Jews for their own suffering is once again fashion? Five, how is it that primal Jew hatred never goes away? Six, how is it that every nation on earth is granted the right to self-existence except Israel? Seven, how is it that every nation on earth is granted the right to self-defense except Israel? Eight, how is it that at this moment, the greatest anti-Semitism is emanating from the far left rather than the far right. Nine, how is it that American college campuses have become the hotbed of anti-Semitism? 10, how is it that those who feel most vulnerable on those campuses are not Hamas supporters, but Jews? 11, how is it that three presidents of Ivy League universities could not bring themselves to unequivocally condemn calls for genocide against the Jews? 12. How is it that those who subtly call for the elimination of Israel with slogans like free Palestine by any means or from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free are celebrated? 13. How is it that those who call for genocide against Israel turn around and accuse Israel of the same? 14. How is it that accusing Jews of the very crime of which they themselves were history's greatest victim can even be countenanced? 15. How is it that respected media like the New York Times, which by the way I continue to read, calls terrorists militants. 16. How is it that Israel's detractors conveniently ignore that Hamas does not support a two-state solution, calls for Israel's destruction in its charter, and boasts, boasts that it would perpetuate October 7th over and over again? I'm almost done. 17. How is it that women's rights organizations around the world have failed to call out the rape and mutilation of Israeli women by Hamas. 18. How is it that some Jews are embarrassed, equivocal, or defensive about Zionism? 19. How is it that Israel's leadership so failed its own people? 20. How is it that I love Israel and cry for Israel every day? especially in light of the terrible news of the death of the six hostages, all these questions are once again swirling uh, in my mind, perhaps on your minds uh, as well. And now as we go back in history and see the steady progression of profiles and courage, Jews taking upon themselves to combat anti-Semitism, perhaps it can help inspire us for the work uh, that, that we have in front of us. Uh, 
I already see 45 messages in, in the chat. And, and I will just say that um, I'm going to leave it to uh, our um, moderator, uh, Gabe, if there's a particular question that, that he spots that is important uh, you know, to ask that he uh, flag it and I'll call upon him to <clears throat> pose the question so that we can all answer it since I know not everybody is, is looking at, at the chat. So uh, having completed uh, my, my introduction, I do want to ask uh, Gabe if there's any particular question that he wants to pose from the, the chat right now before we, uh, before we go on. Gabe, I also want to say, you know, you know, at the end, we will pause before uh, two o'clock to, to answer some questions as well. Yeah, um, nothing really in question form, mostly just asking for a copy of your great <laughs> blog post, which I provided the Times of Israel link, but maybe we can email it to everyone. Uh, you are, you're very it. good, Gabe. You're ahead, ahead of the game if you already found the blog site and, and, and provided that. There's also uh, another piece on the banality of anti-Semitism in the blog space uh, that is, in, in fact, uh, I, th I think particularly uh, relevant. And my experience with an organization I've supported for decades that utterly failed the test of standing up to uh, anti-Semitism. But I don't want to go astray uh, uh, further uh, than that. Uh, so uh, with that, we're going to... Uh, to jump into um, American Jewish history. And I should note something else. Uh, in part, the reason why I'm going to uh, tell the stories of each of these turning points by reading Norman's words from the book is because that's the best way I know of paying tribute to, uh, to Norman. He was so successful as a writer because he wrote in simple language and the stories he told flowed, flowed along. And, uh, and so uh, I will read the story as it's told by Norman in the book, pause to make some of my own comments. If, if we get comments from, from you, we can add to that, you know, before we go on to the next story. And as uh, some of you know, the very beginning of the American Jewish experience occurred this time of the year, in early September of 1654. And Norman writes, in early September 1654, after a harrowing voyage from Cuba, the French uh, ship Sainte Catarina docked in New Amsterdam, today's New York, and discharged a bedraggled group of 23 Jewish men, women, and children. In the little colony, their identity as Jews was immediately revealed. They were perceived as different. In response, the Reverend Johann Megapolinus, the leader of the American colony's Dutch Reformed Church, the only religious denomination permitted to hold public services in the colony, complained that there would be, quote, a still greater confusion if the obstinate and immovable Jews were to settle here. So the group of people, Dutch, who had settled New Amsterdam, were not kindly predisposed to having Jews here, which is a little bit curious considering the strength of the Jewish community, which we'll comment upon in Amsterdam itself. And their lead reverend made a disparaging comment. But what was more significant, more consequential, was how Peter Stevenson, the new Amsterdam governor, responded. He was also not pleased with these newcomers. He immediately wrote to his superiors at the Dutch West India Company in Amsterdam, chartered by the Dutch Parliament to organize and oversee all Dutch ventures in the Western Hemisphere. The Jews, he said, were, quote, repugnant and, quote, a deceitful race. And he wrote requesting permission 
to require them in a friendly way to depart. Peter Stuyvesant was the first of a long line of uh, American, or in this case, pre-American, anti-Semitic uh, leaders. Now, this group of 23 Jews from Recife, Brazil, were not about to go quietly. Norman writes, the Jews, however, were not willing to oblige. They had been through hell to get to New Amsterdam, and they were not about to leave. They had come from Recife, an important seaport in Brazil. Most of them were descended from conversos. Starting in the early 15th century, conversos had come to the New World, hoping to find refuge far away from the Inquisition. When the Dutch captured the colony in 1630, those secret Jews who had not already reclaimed their Jewish identity in Amsterdam openly and proudly did so in Recife. Holland was a welcoming place for Jews, and now that the Jews were in control, the Jews of Recife could maintain their reclaimed identity. They established synagogues, created a Jewish communal organization, and even imported a rabbi from Holland. By the way, Norman does not mention this, but the rabbi Aboabab, who they imported from Holland, was one of three key rabbis of the community and most probably the teacher of a young Jew descended from conversos in Amsterdam that you may have heard of. His name, Baruch Spinoza. So in any case, he spends several years there. Uh, but by the 1940s, military skirmishes were increasing between the Dutch and the Portuguese troops attempting to reclaim Recife. And in 1654, the Portuguese retook control of the area. Because it was now under Portuguese control, the Jews felt unsettled. The, those group of 23 Jews were actually bound back for Amsterdam when their first ship was waylaid, possibly by pirates. They ended up in Cuba on a French ship that made the unexpected uh, stop in New Amsterdam for these Jews, and they thought it would be best to go there. Now, back to Peter um, Stuyvesant. Uh, he sent a request to the Dutch West India Company to kick the Jews out. The petition reminded the directors that the company had invited industrious people to settle in the Dutch colonies of the New World. And now I'm directly quoting from Peter Stuyvesant's petition. It is well known to your honors that the Jewish nation in Brazil have at all times been uh, faithful excuse me, this is the response of the Jews, and have striven to guard and maintain that place, risking for that purpose their possessions and their blood. Yonder land is extensive and spacious. The more loyal people that go to live there, the better it is in regard to the population of the country. So they responded to Stuyvesant's petition by saying, we're here, you know, we are willing to take care of ourselves, and then they added one other argument. Listen carefully. Your honors should also please consider that many of the Jewish nation are principal shareholders in the company. Yes, those 23 Jews reminded them that there were Jewish shareholders, important ones, thankfully, in the Dutch West India uh, country. And uh, they were not above playing politics, exerting political pressure for their own sake. The society in, New in Amsterdam was remarkably economically strong one. And so do you know how the Dutch West India Company responded to Peter Stuyvesant? I'll quote to you. 
these people may travel and trade to and in New Netherland and live and remain there, provided the poor among them shall not become a burden to the company or to the community, but be supported by their own nation. Peter Stuyvesant's objections were overruled. His petition was denied and he was given clear direction. He appealed it and was denied a second time uh, as well. Thanks to the Dutch West India Company, and thanks perhaps to some of the Jewish shareholders looking out for their brethren, those 23 Jews who unexpectedly ended up in New Amsterdam, today in New York, were here, and they were here uh, for good. Uh, I'll already comment, the turning point from a flashpoint to a turning point, because what did these Jews do? They stood up for their rights. They appealed to political leadership, and they uh, prevailed. We owe them a debt of gratitude for creating uh, the, the first step forward on American soil for the American Jewish community. But what does this incident also tell us? There were problems from day one. We can't hide that fact. From the very first Jews then to our Jewish community today, there, there are challenges with anti-Semitism, even in the Golden Medina, even in this wonderful country of ours. Before we leave New Amsterdam, I want to also tell you what happened one year later, because it's important, it's significant. Um, there's a, uh, a public school and a public park in New York City to this very day, named for Asher Levy. If you don't know that name, and you probably don't, unless you've studied American Jewish history in particular, he's a forgotten hero. Because although he was not part of the original 23, he, uh, Ashkenazi Jew, as opposed to these Sephardic Jews, or possibly they say of mixed heritage, he arrived within that next year, along with a few other Jews. And uh, Asher Levy, turns out to be a force in himself. In July of 1655, the governor issued a call to form a militia of all able-bodied men. The question now arose whether or not to include Jewish men. The governor, not our greatest friend, made the decision owing to the disgust and unwillingness of the militiamen to be fellow soldiers, to be on guard with the same at the guardhouse, Jews cannot be permitted to serve as soldiers and should be exempt. Instead, for the privilege of not serving, Jews alone were required to pay a monthly tax of 65 stivers. So what did Stuyvesant say? We don't want Jews in the militia. And instead, we're going to impose a special tax on them as well. Well, Asher Levy refused to pay the tax. In November of 1655, he formally petitioned Stuyvesant, requesting that he and another Jew be allowed to stand guard duty like every other male citizen of New Amsterdam or be excused from paying the unfair tax. Stuyvesant denied the request with the advice that if they didn't like living there, they might, quote, go elsewhere if they liked. Nonetheless, after apparently turning to the directors of the Dutch West India Company in Amsterdam to help resolve the matter, Levy and the other Jewish uh, citizen Baronson began to stand guard alongside the other men of New uh, Amsterdam. That's quite an accomplishment from one individual standing up to the governor, to Peter Stuyvesant. In September of 1655, as Native Americans continued threatening the little colony, the decision was made to build a wall around it. 
that required money. So Stuyvesant and the colony leadership requested voluntary contributions from all the residents. The Jews were required to pay one twelfth of the total, despite constituting only one thirtieth of the population. So again, the Jews protested to the directors of the Dutch West India Company. They refused to accept the injustice here. In a letter dated March 14th of 1656, they described their previous petitions to them and made clear their current demands to be treated equally with other residents being taxed. 100 years before the Declaration of Independence, they called for no taxation without representation. Asher Levy continued to fight for the equal rights of the small Jewish community in matters concerning um, uh, trade. Uh, the directors, by the way, started to get uh, annoyed with Stuyvesant. He, his frustration grew. He was a difficult uh, character. And he had his council pass a new ordinance limiting trade to those who held burger, full citizenship, and only one of the Jews in New Amsterdam was given the right to claim that. Once again, Asher Levy said, this is not right. He appealed to the burghers themselves, and on the strength of his argument, he prevailed all Jewish men in the colony had the right to be recognized as burghers with the full rights thereof. Norman concludes this section, Asher Levy was not afraid to stand up for the rights due him and his fellow Jews. He set an example that would long be remembered by the fledgling Jewish community, both then and later. And as I mentioned, in fact, the park, a school, and a recreation center are all named after him in New York City. By the time Levy died around 1680, the, Jew, the growing Jewish community was taking root in American soil. Thus, the first chapter, you might say, in American Jewish history in New Amsterdam, replete with uh, anti-Semitism, but also with the brave 23 and Asher Levy standing up for the rights of the Jewish community. I'm going to uh, uh, continue now, as I don't uh, see Gabe with us to see if there's any uh, questions, but um, if there are, they can be posed at the end of the session uh, as well. Oh, Gabe, there you are. Sorry, I keep my video off. I'm still, I'm always here. Um, yeah, there are questions, I think, that are a little more contemporary. So maybe at the end, we can pull okay. all these threads together. If there's uh, something about what you're saying, specifically about the history, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in for sure. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Very good. And so uh, with that, um, and of course, I've identified, by the way, uh, you should all know, uh, if, if you uh, do purchase the book, and it's a very enjoyable read, uh, not the subject, but I'm talking about uh, the way Norman writes, an important read. Uh, but I identified 36 turning points, um, as, it, as it turns out, in, in his book. We're only going to be able to, to do maybe a third of those in this three-part uh, class. Uh, so there are other turning points that I'll be skipping over. But in the colonial period, there's one other. It's the most famous uh, that I wouldn't want to skip at all. So we're going to go from New Amsterdam in 1654 to Newport, Rhode Island, in August of 1790, after the United States has won the Revolutionary War, declared its independence and, an, and a new nation. And I'd like to uh, share with you, once again, uh, after this image of the book, saying no to hate, overcoming anti-Semitism in America, this first image, and perhaps many of you have actually visited. What you see here 
is a picture of the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, consecrated in 1763. It's the oldest synagogue building in America. It's not the oldest congregation in America. That distinction belongs to Ashari Israel in Manhattan, but it's the oldest synagogue building, one of the oldest <coughs> synagogues. Newport was a very important city, uh, a, a whaling um, uh, city, and uh, at the time, Jews lived in great numbers in Newport, in New Amsterdam, in Charleston, and in Savannah, in particular on the eastern um, the seaboard. As you are uh, perhaps aware, uh, one of the leaders of that uh, congregation named Moses Seishas, S-E-I-X-A-S, from a distinguished colonial Jewish family, anticipating uh, and inviting the new president of the United States, George Washington, to perhaps make a visit or at least to correspond. And in August 17th of 1790, he wrote uh, this letter to George Washington. Sir, permit the children of the stock of Abraham to approach you with the most cordial affection and esteem for your person and merits, and to join with our fellow citizens in welcoming you to Newport. With pleasure, we reflect on those days, those days of difficulty and danger, when the God of Israel, who delivered David from the peril of the sword, shielded your head in the day of battle. And we rejoice to think that the same spirit who rested in the bosom of the greatly beloved Daniel enabled him to preside over the provinces of the Babylonian Empire, rests and ever will upon you, enabling you to discharge the arduous duties of chief magistrate of these states. I love the flowery language of these old letters. Deprived as we here too have been of the invaluable rights of free citizens, we now with a deep sense of gratitude to the almighty disposer of all events, Behold, a government erected by the majesty of the people, a government which to bigotry gives no sanction, to persecution no assistance, but generously affording to all liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship, deeming everyone of whatever nation, tongue, or language equal parts of the great governmental machine, this is so ample and extensive federal union whose basis is philanthropy, mutual confidence, and public virtue. We cannot but acknowledge to be the work of the great God who ruleth in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, doing whatever seemeth him good. And Moses Satius concludes his letter, for all these blessings of civil and religious liberty, which we enjoy under an equal benign administration, we desire to send up our thanks to the Ancient of Days, the great preserver of men, beseeching him that the angel who conducted our forefathers through the wilderness into the promised land may graciously conduct you through all the difficulties and dangers of this mortal life. And when, like Joshua, full of days and full of honor, you are gathered to your fathers, may you be admitted into the heavenly paradise to partake of the water of life and the tree of immortality. What gracious words, flowery words from Moses Satius to George Washington. Well, later that month, President George Washington penned his reply to the Jewish congregation in Newport, a response that would become the iconic affirmation of acceptance to successive generations of American Jews. And now as I read it, it's short, about the same length. I want you to, to notice how George Washington incorporates and echoes phrases from Moshe Satius in his reply. George Washington often gets the credit to the famous line, to bigotry, no sanction. 
but you might have learned just now, it was actually Moses Satius who wrote that and George Washington who quoted back to him and to the congregation with that. You may have heard this letter. It's actually read aloud every year in a big ceremony at the Newport Toro uh, uh, Synagogue. Gentlemen, while I receive with much satisfaction your address replete with expressions of affection and esteem, I rejoice in the opportunity of assuring you that I shall always retain a grateful remembrance of the cordial welcome I experienced in my visit to Newport from all classes of citizens. And it goes on. Um, the citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. Now listen carefully. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class that another enjoys the exercise of their inherent natural rights for happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So what is George Washington saying? He's saying, this is a country that does more than tolerate minorities. We embrace them as full citizens, provided they exercise that uh, good citizenship. Beyond toleration to what today we call pluralism. Washington, in, in this document, which is considered one of the most important in American history, not just American Jewish history, um, is saying that we are a pluralistic society, not merely one and not a Christian one that tolerates other minorities. And he concludes his letter, it would be inconsistent with the frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes for my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree. That's quoting the prophet Micah, by the way. And there shall be none to make them afraid. May the father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy. Signed, George Washington, August 21st, 1790. So our great first president made it abundantly clear in this key exchange of correspondence with one of the earliest Jewish congregations. And he also wrote to other Jewish congregations as well um, that uh, America was a welcoming place for all religions and uh, for all uh, its citizens as well. That would be uh, put to the test many times uh, over, but part of that ethic would be codified in the Constitution of the uh, United States uh, that had just been uh, ratified in Philadelphia in June of 1788. I'll just uh, paraphrase a, a few more um, turning points in this early colonial period before we then pause for um, some uh, uh, questions. One of the most uh, remarkable figures that you can read about in this book is a man named Mordecai Manuel Noah. He becomes the first Jewish diplomat of note uh, when he is appointed an ambassador um, to Morocco. But 
in the uh, early administration under um, Adams and Jefferson, uh, when it's determined that, um, found out that he's Jewish, his uh, ambassadorship is recalled. And the uh, Manuel Noah himself and his uh, allies, Jews in various political positions throughout the colonies, now the early states, um, fought against this as well. In fact, um, they reminded leaders that the Constitution says that there shall be no litmus test of religion for holding um, office. Besides the First Amendment, which guarantees the freedom of, of worship, uh, as you know, freedom of uh, religion, the Constitution in the body of its uh, of the Constitution itself indicates that. However, at this point, states were still free in their own constitutions and codices to make their own rules. And there were several um, states, most notably the state of Maryland, which had in their constitution that in order to hold a political office in that state, you needed to be a professing Christian. So one of the next major cases in this early period of uh, American Jewish history was the attempt to advocate for what became known a little primitively as the Jew Bill. The Jew Bill sought to eliminate that litmus test. It became a years-long um, battle. But happily, in January of 1826, so you see it was more than a 25-year um, effort, uh, the Jew bill passed, meaning that the clause was eliminated from Maryland, and it fell in several other states afterwards as well. That took place in Annapolis. And uh, finally, uh, I want to... Um, conclude this this portion uh, by highlighting the efforts of a remarkable Jewish woman, perhaps the first Jewish woman of note in American Jewish history, and her name is Rebecca Gratz. You can find um, her story in pay, on page uh, 41 and 42. I believe, there's Mordecai Manuel Noah, by the way, a portrait of, of him that I just spoke about. Uh, you can see this, correct, Gabe? Correct. And here is Rebecca Gratz of Philadelphia, and the figure here, uh, Tribute says, uh, credited with founding the first Jewish Sunday school in America. A very beautiful portrait, I might add, of Rebecca uh, Gratz. She was from a prominent colonial Jewish American family, um, and she recognized very presciently the need for Jewish children in, in, in America to receive supplemental Jewish education in addition to public school education. And she began um, the Sunday school movement as we know, including many other philanthropic uh, activities. So one way of combating anti-Semitism, importantly, has always been to invigorate Jewish learning, Jewish pride, Jewish education, Jewish identity. And uh, Rebecca Gratz had a leading role. You may know that in Philadelphia today, there is a college called Gratz College. As a matter of fact, uh, the new president of Gratz College is a JPS author, Zev Elif, uh, and a colleague and friend of mine. That is, uh, goes back to the contributions of uh, the Gratz family. And I, I will also add that uh, an extremely important figure 
two decades after Rebecca Gratz in Philadelphia named Isaac Leeser, L-E-E-S-E-R, said, we have to do more to combat the proselytization of Christian groups besides education in schools. We need a society to publish Jewish works here in America. And that was the origins of the Jewish Publication Society. Isaac Leeser did, did a number of great things. He was also one of the uh, leaders of the Mikva Israel Congregation in Philadelphia. He formed the first Jewish Publication Society, the forerunner of the present JPS. And he was responsible for the first translation of the Hebrew Bible into American English on American um, soil. And in fact, the JPS translations, the great translations of 1917, and then later um, in the 20th century, were in fact based on Leeser's first attempt uh, at that. So what we find out is people like Rebecca uh, Gratz and Isaac Leeser combated anti-Semitism in the positive ways of enhancing the Jewish identity and the Jewish learning in our community. Let me uh, also add, and then I will uh, conclude and, and see if there are any questions, uh, but let me also highlight that um, a little bit later, in the 1880s, many of you may have heard of a, a remarkable Jewish woman named Henrietta Zold. Now, Henrietta Zold, yes, was the founder of Hadassah. I see a couple of people giving me a thumbs up, and we may have some Hadassah members here. And all power to what she did with Hadassah, and then later with Youth Aliyah in Israel. But I want to inform the 254 lucky people here on uh, in my session today that before Hadassah and before Youth Aliyah, Henrietta Zold was the first editor-in-chief of the Jewish Publication Society. She worked there for some 20 years. And the first great books of JPS were all edited by this woman, the, the daughter of a rabbi, such a learned woman in her own right. And she might have, and don't let this go out of this room, she might have stayed at JPS and never founded Hadassah or Youth Aliyah in Israel, except for a broken heart. What do I mean? In the course of editing, one of JPS's early great classics, still in print, called Legends of the Jews by Louis Finkelstein, she fell in love with him. And she thought that he fell in love with her. But then he went off to Europe to do some research one summer, and he came back with another woman. It broke her heart, and she never felt fully appreciated or compensated the way she should have been at JPS. And so she left JPS and went on to other great um, exploits. But the reason I'm telling this story is that like Rebecca Gratz, Henrietta Zoll made a great contribution to American Jewish community, and JPS in part was founded to combat the anti-Semitism emanating from Christian missionary groups at that time. So having visited New Amsterdam and Newport, Rhode Island and Philadelphia in the early period of American Jewish history, we're going to stop there. We're going to entertain any questions and then call it a day. Thank Gabe, you. Uh, any any questions? Yeah, there are some interesting questions. Just first oh, of all, Gabe, thank you for that. If I can interrupt you, one question that I saw flash on the screen. Um, Norman H. Finkelstein, the beloved author of our book, had the unfortunate um, reality of being having the same name as a different Norman Finkelstein, the Professor Norman Finkelstein, a known uh, I'll call him anti-Zionist, perhaps uh, anti-Semitic <laughs> Jew. And so many people throughout his life confused Norman with, with, uh, with Norman. But as far as I know, there was no relation between 
Nor our Norman, who loved Jewish education and was a strong Zionist and everything else, and the other Norman, who's entitled to his views. But yes, do not be confused by the two Norman Finkelsteins. Thank you for that. And thank you for a very interesting lecture on some very interesting figures. Um, there were a bunch of the contemporary things, you know, a lot of questions about Israel and all that. I feel like you will get to in in later classes since we only have a few minutes. Gabe, Gabe I, like we, we will could... devote, um, uh, I will make sure to devote a good amount of time at the end of the third session. You'll, ha you'll have to wait. I do hope you are able to return or view this on the recording to discussing what combating anti-Semitism means, what what uh, supporting Israel means in in that final session, kind of as a glimpse um, forward. So uh, the contemporary questions about what's happening right now, yes, we'll we'll save them for the end of the third session. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um... The, then there are a couple that I want to sort of combine thematically that are really um, kind of asking for some of your rabbinic wisdom, I think, beyond the history. Uh, and Daniela is one to ask, um, how how does one deal with what's going on today psychologically? Did these figures that you're talking about, has it been written about how they dealt with, how how they took a stand, how, you know, were, were they specific type of people or were they very psychologically sturdy? Do they have to work at it? And, and like, how, how did they become these turning point figures in history and how, how can people today take those um, sort of character trait lessons? Well, one of the things I think we've already learned today, just from the few uh, stories and historical incidents um, from the first part of American Jewish history uh, was that, these, these individuals did not bury their head in the sands. They were not passive. When there was an injustice, they kind of calmly figured out how's the best way to confront this and who can I talk to? It was about allies. Remember those 23 Jews and uh, Asher Levy, they appealed to the Dutch West India Company. You know, when the efforts were being made by Solomon Enger to pass the Jew Bill, they they went and surrounded themselves with allies in the Maryland um, uh, parliament. Um, and uh, so one of the things we learn is not to be passive, you know, to stand up, but to create political allies, to create political pressure. And that's part of the way that you halt it, um, individuals and organizations that are moving uh, against you. And then what we learned from examples like Rebecca Gratz and Henrietta Zold is at the same time that you're doing that, which, for example, the ADL as an organization, you know, does very effectively. At the same time, you have to strengthen you know, yourselves and your your own community through enhanced education. So so those are, are, are two of the lessons. But even on a very local level, if in your school board or in your township, you know, there are things happening that you don't like, you combat it. You call your congressman, you talk to the mayor of your town, uh, and you, you see what steps can be taken and not afraid to demonstrate on, on your own. Because the theory that by shying away and not drawing attention to anti-Semites uh, will be the best view? No. They thrive in the dark, and you have to shine the light on them. Yeah, that's great advice. Taking action um, definitely, I think, feels better psychologically, too, than sitting around yes, and, and doing And, and forging well. coalitions, finding finding your allies, because it's always more effective when you can uh, you know, advocate with other people around you, Jews and non-Jews alike. And I guess one um, we could end on, um, Diane in Wisconsin um, said, we're, you know, many residents beyond Milwaukee and Madison have never met a Jewish person. Um, study of the Holocaust is now mandated by the state there. Um, are there better ways to teach um, about the Jewish people besides just Holocaust 
education in schools? Um, should we be thinking about how we can? That's, uh, you know, that's an important question and, and yet another uh, avenue. When we talk about self-education, that's for, for our own benefit and, and our own strengthening. Uh, but efforts to, to teach about the history of the Jews and other minority groups is so important. And yes, there are, there are states like my own state of New Jersey that mandate a curriculum. There are states that have not. You know, there are states that talk, teach the Bible as literature and talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, Israelites, the ancient Jewish people. Uh, but to the extent that we can look for opportunities as a rabbi, I have come into so many different public school classrooms over the years to give uh, a guest lecture, usually connected to the holiday and get in some Jewish history uh, as well. But advocating for, for greater ed education, of course, the Holocaust and the state of, of, of Israel formation of state in modern Jewish history, but also to give people a little appreciation because yes, we, we assume you know, that people have a knowledge base which they don't have. And so the teaching of history matters. That's why I'm doing this course, among other reasons. But history matters and the extent to which we can advocate uh, for this as part of public education in the United States, extremely important. Yeah, and I love some people are in the chat talking about staying in touch, emailing and texting each other and, and supporting each other. That's great to see. Um, so we're past two. Uh, I think we should wrap up. And um, if I didn't get, if I missed one of your questions, bring it again next week. We'll be same time, same place, same Zoom link. Um, and we'll keep going through American history. Thank you, Rabbi Schwartz. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Hope to see you as we continue on. All the best. Oh, and of course, you. yes, many people asked, you will get the recording tomorrow uh, with other links and things. So, Thank you again, right. Gabe, and thank you to everybody for being here. See you all soon. Bye-bye.